my name is Walt Fick, and uh, Doug Shoup and I are going to be tag teaming this presentation this afternoon on pasture weed and, and brush management. Okay, so there's a slide that says, What is a weed? And, and typical definition is plant growing out of place. Some, some have said weeds are plants whose virtues have not yet been discovered. I get a number of uh, emails and phone calls about plants that animals might not be eating, and many times those are, are considered weeds as, as well. Uh, here's a list then of, of various weeds, annuals, perennials, and biennials. You'll notice on, on this list, uh, broad leaves as well as, as grasses. Uh, annuals, of course, are plants that uh, produce seed and, and you know, complete their life cycle in a single year. Uh, so you see broomweed and, and the ragweed species listed there. Uh, biennial species are plants then that take two years to complete their, their growth cycle. Uh, musk thistle would be probably the most common one that we have across the state and on our range of pastures. Uh, perennial weeds, uh, you know, the ironweed, goldenrod, Johnson grass, of course, which is one of our, our noxious weeds, and then the listed Ceresia lespedeza, which is a, another noxious weed. Uh, and then one that we're becoming more concerned about uh, are old world blue stems. Uh, brush, on the other hand, then, are woody vegetation that we consider undesirable for planned use of an area. So you see a number of shrubs listed here, the buckbrush, smooth shumac, dogwood, blackberry, and so forth. And then trees, uh, including eastern red cedar, uh, Osage orange or hedge, common honey locust, and so forth. Before we get into the actual uh, control of, of these broadleaf plants and, and woody plants, I wanted to emphasize that, that some of these plants do have uh, value to them. They add to the production and, and oftentimes forage quality. Some of our, some of our forbs are, are higher quality, for instance, particularly crude protein-wise uh, compared to our grasses. And woody plants uh, the bro provide browse in for, more so for sheep and goats and, and of course, deer that run around rather than cattle, but, but cattle do consume, consume certain woody plants. Uh, these plants protect watersheds. Uh, legumes have the capability to uh, fix nitrogen. Uh, trees also provide shade and winter protection and cover uh, during the winter time, uh, shade in the, in the summer, and of course they're valuable for, for wildlife habitat. Uh, here's a list of, of four different species that uh, Dr. Casey Olson in animal science and his students have found that during the year uh, that cattle consume a significant amount of these plants, uh, particularly as a, in, as a group, a dotted gay feather, heath aster, lead plant, which is a, a shrub, a legume, and then purple prairie clover, which is a herbaceous legume. But these four species can make up as much as 25% of the diet uh, during the course of the year. One thing we need to understand is, is why do these unwanted plants in, invade? Because if, if we don't understand that, sometimes we're just out there treating the symptoms rather than solving the problem. Uh, at least in, in the eastern part of Kansas, you know, the, the lack of burning uh, is pretty evident that if we don't burn with some frequency, we get quite a bit of woody plant invasion. Climatic fluctuations, uh, both, you know, when it's wet, I think here this last summer, for instance, we saw uh, species like musk thistle and Ceresia lespedeza probably increasing because of the wetter weather. Uh, dry conditions, you know, favor, favor some other deeper rooted plants. Uh, seed does get transported around by, by wind and water and animals, and we ourselves need to be careful uh, when we're driving through stands of, of unwanted plants, uh, particularly some of these noxious weeds that we aren't picking up on our vehicles or in the muddy tracks of, of vehicles and so forth. Uh, extreme overgrazing by domestic livestock could also cause some some problems with invasion of unwanted plants. And I think we'll see that, that decreased fertility in tame pastures, I think that's critically important to, to maintain competitive stands to, to keep these plants out. And I think that, that leads us into this, this next slide, and, and Doug, uh, you can take over. Okay, so thanks, Walt. I, uh, or the way we kind of broke this up for everybody, trying to figure out the best way to tag team this is I'll cover some 
things on tame grasses for uh, for pasture and hay meadow. So that would be Bermuda grass. I'm in southeast Kansas, so we have a lot of Bermuda grass, fescue, and brome down here, uh, with quite a bit of range as well. But uh, just like Walt mentioned, the the fertility is something that I see more often than not. Just like what Walt said is. Uh, you try and treat the symptom. Everybody wants to jump to the herbicide first, but I think uh, uh, if we just look at our fertility program, that can do a lot. Significant changes in our uh, growing the forage that we desire and, and shading out the weeds. And I think the best example of that is broom sedge. It's fairly common in southeast Kansas. I actually started to spread out into other regions of Kansas, further north and further west as well. This is a grass that uh, is just a prime example of one that thrives on low phosphorus environments. And so uh, there's been several studies uh, out there showing that if we can just uh, take a soil sample, let's see what uh, that soil needs, and we can outcompete the broom sedge. It's actually fairly uh, not very competitive itself, and there's a lot of studies out there that show just uh, adding phosphorus or lime or or nitrogen, uh, more often it's a, a need of phosphorus and, and lime more often that we can shade that out. That graph there on the right is uh, one from Missouri where uh, in southwest Missouri they looked at um, just adding different uh, different lime rates but also with and without 50 pounds of phosphorus. You can see uh, it, after two years of uh, that initial application you move the fescue composition from 15 percent up to 35 and you start to have a little bit of a decrease on that broom sedge and so uh, obviously it doesn't make up a hundred percent of the composition so that fescue is really uh, taken over some other broad leaves as well it's not just a change in broom sedge so but the thing to remember is that it is a process that's slow in general and it takes a couple years go ahead well uh, same can be seen uh, in Bermuda grass as well. We have a fair amount of Bermuda grass. This was some work done in Oklahoma uh, on the same, we see the same kind of pattern with, uh, with uh, fertility, 100 and 200 pounds of nitrogen and then whatever the soil test called for phosphorus and potassium. Again, we see that same trend in, in Bermuda grass as well. Increase in tonnage, but uh, the big change was is that we significantly reduced that uh, that broom sedge. So just paying attention to your fertility can help decrease weeds. Okay. So the the thing uh, that I've been calculating, uh, we do this uh, several years or this time every year, I guess, is how much nitrogen do you put on? And I ran some of these numbers recently for Bermuda grass and. And I apologize to my Oklahoma friends down there. They have a lot more Bermuda grass fertility work than, than I can find here in Kansas. But we do have eight studies uh, done nitrogen rates on, on Bermuda grass. And, and uh, the thing about Bermuda grass is it loves nitrogen. And you can just keep adding more nitrogen and it keeps producing for you. And so doing some little uh, simple economics here. Uh, and I'm even saying terrible hay price at $50 a ton. And uh, we can get nitrogen cheaper than 40 cents a pound, but I think the main takeaway of this and that chart is that every additional 40 pounds we put to that Bermuda grass, we still see about two tenths of a, a return per ton per a ton per acre, and actually that pays off in an environment where we're trying to pinch pennies. It's kind of surprising that uh, nitrogen maybe isn't something that we need to skimp on this year. Um, if you need the hay that uh, the nitrogen price is just so cheap that it's actually paying out to fertilize even when your hay price stinks. So uh, we'll move to the next one. Uh, we also have, uh, I've done that with uh, fescue as well. <laughs> this one kind of surprised me. We had uh, 25 nitrogen studies on, on fescue. I kind of run that same regression line on, on those points. And again, actually fescue uh, turns out to be a, a pretty good return as well. But it's just that cheap nitrogen price that we shouldn't uh, shouldn't disregard this year. Uh, hit the next one, Walt. Uh, the thing that I always encourage my growers to consider is that, yeah, we, we add nitrogen for tonnage, but it's also really important for protein as well. And so uh, if we do skimp on nitrogen or at least add none, then you're also sacrificing uh, the quality of that forage and, and the quality later in the year when you may actually need it when the, when the uh, quality starts dropping off significantly in the months of the end of May and in the months of June when when uh, 
uh, we need it um, to carry us through later into the summer. So I, I've just been encouraging my growers not to forget about nitrogen this year when they're looking to pinch pennies a little bit. Okay, Doug. Uh, we're going to get into the controller management options then that, that are available to us. And this is pretty typical of this. Some, sometimes some of these practices some might call cultural practices, but must remember I'm, I'm a grazing range management person, so grazing management's on, on my list of options. But then we'll talk about mechanical prescribed burning, a little bit on biological as, as well as chemical control methods. Uh, so our grazing management, the, the main principles of grazing management include these, you know, the kind of animal. Uh, you know, this part of the world is pretty much a, a beef state, but there are other animals, and I'll show you one picture of some another kind of animal that we can use. Uh, season of use refers to, you know, trying to utilize our forages, you know, whatever they are at the time of the year that they're most productive and, and highest quality. Uh, we'd like to most, most of the time distribute our grazing across uh, our pastures evenly, uh, although that's, you know, sometimes easier said than, than done because animals do tend to uh, patch graze and start their, their grazing lawns. Uh, but by far the, the most important of, of these is stocking rate. And, and stocking rate, of course, is just the number of animals per unit area for a given point in time. And, you know, as, as we increase stocking rates, uh, individual animal performance is going to decline, uh, whereas gain per, per unit area will increase at least up to a point. And, and that, that sort of response is seem to be true whether we're talking about native range or our improved pastures. Uh, here's, here's an example of, of what I might call a, a targeted grazing approach with, with goats. In this case, they're standing on their hind legs even, trying to graze some the needles and leaves off of, off a of salt cedar. Uh, but, but these sort of animals have, have been used for brush control. And also we're seeing a pretty good use of, of uh, a plant like Cerecia lespedeza as well. Uh, with goats as well as well as sheep. Uh, the mechanical approaches then, we have hand tools, which are, are small loppers uh, that can be utilized, uh, mowing machines. Uh, the picture here has a couple of pictures of tree cutters. Uh, the top photo is a, a turbo saw, you know, these rotary bladed ones that go around circular and cut right up to ground level. Uh, the lower right picture is, is a hydro axe. Uh, but those also now have been designed quite well, so they'll also cut off at ground level. Uh, and then, of course, bulldozers have been used uh, sometimes in clean, cleaning out uh, bigger trees or, or dense brush. Uh, these mechanical methods then, you know, are, are particularly effective on non-sprouting species. Here's eastern red cedar, and fortunately it is a non-sprouter. We can cut it right, right at the ground level. As long as we do so below any green branch, uh, that tree is not going to uh, re-sprout. Uh, sprouting species, though, and that includes most all our other woody plants, they're salt cedar, you know, a matter of a couple of months af after being uh, cut off, and you see the multiple sprouts coming back uh, on it. And uh, so that's going to require something in addition to just mechanical control. Uh, prescribed burning, uh, something we use a great deal here in, in the tall grass prairies, but we see it being used elsewhere in the state. Uh, talking about brush and weed control today, and that is one of the things we can use prescribed uh, burning for. And in, in general, is when those the plants are going to be more susceptible to fire, uh, if they're leafed out or at maybe a low point in their carbohydrate uh, reserve cycle. So here's a you know, eastern red cedar, very susceptible to fire. Here you can see some trees that were probably even eight feet tall that were completely desiccated. Takes a pretty good amount of fuel to, to get trees that size. Typically, we think if we have maybe 12 to 1,500 pounds uh, per acre of, of dry forage, that we can probably get three to four foot cedars with that sort of a, a fuel load. Uh, bigger trees is going to require, require more. Uh, one of our better examples for, for biological control would be the musk thistle head weevil, as you see here, the adult uh, beetle in the upper left, the females lay their 
their eggs on the developing head of the musk thistle, and then the, the larvae emerge, and you see in the lower right, you might be able to pick out a little white larvae in there, and, and they feed on the part of the, the developing seed head where that seed would be produced. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily eliminate all seed production, but uh, this type of control has, has been beneficial, you know, over the years in, in reducing seed production. Now we get into our, our chemical application methods and a number of ways of applying herbicides, you know, both broadcast foliar treatments, you know, ground applied, we're probably applying 10 to 20 gallons per acre total solution. Aerial applications will, will be from, from quite low. Sometimes you'll maybe at least two, and, and sometimes we'll recommend four or five gallons per acre to make, ensure that we get the coverage needed to, to do a good job of controlling some of these plants. Uh, a high volume application then is, is one that you're probably applying oh, 50 to even 100 gallons per acre. Oftentimes those are you know, spot treatments or individual plant type treatments. Uh, the single stem non foliar methods then include basal control, uh, which usually mixing a herbicide then um, like Remedy Ultra with, with uh, diesel and, and applying that on the lower oh, 12 to 15 inches all the way around the trunk. Uh, some dormant stem applications have been used, uh, but the other method would be cut stump where we're actually like that resprouting uh, salt cedar pitcher that I showed you if we when you cut those off and then treat those stumps before we see uh, new growth on from the from the trunk, uh, we that can be quite effective as well. And then we do have soil applied uh, materials, both pellets and liquids that I'll talk about a little later that that can be, be used for for brush control in particular. One of the things we've used for for years for timing of, of herbicides, particularly the foliar applied herbicides. Uh, is looking at the, the food reserve cycle. So we have here the percent root T and C refers to total non-structural carbohydrates. And here we have buck brush, which, which is the dash line that you see there more or less on the bottom. And then the solid line is smooth shumac. Notice that, that the low point in these, these cycles are not the same. Uh, and, and thus, like many cases, it's hard to go out there and treat at one time with a foliar applied herbicide and expect to get all the species that might be in a stand that you're trying to reduce. You know, buck brush, that low point occurs uh, late April, early May, and you're applying a herbicide, and after that would be, be quite effective. Uh, but at that low point, you know, prescribed fire can also be effective on, on a species like buck brush. Smooth sumac is, is about a month later. Uh, into June before it reaches that, that low point. Uh, again, but herbicides in about that early to mid-June time frame have proven to be, that's been a very effective time uh, to control that species. <clears throat> so um, I guess I'll, I'll mention a few things here about chemical control in, in, the, in the tame forage is the, um, like Walt mentioned, we have, uh, it's very important to pay attention to the low point in the carbohydrate reserve cycle, but a lot of times in these tame forages, uh, I would say we deal with a lot more annuals probably than we do with perennials. And so that's, uh, that low point may not be, uh, or is not as, as critical with annuals as it is with perennials. Um, and so uh, I spend some time talk, giving recommendations out for, for uh, tame grass, uh, weed control with chemicals. Um, I think the thing that I stress is you just have to be ca conscious or at least uh, cautious about the herbicides that you use on a few of our team forages. And, and uh, of course we have a lot of growth regulators that go out, um, you know, 2,4-D, Banvol, Tordon, Remedy, those types of things. And, and they're extremely safe on grass or grass only or they're broadleaf only herbicides. But uh, we have seen several instances and of where those can actually stunt some of our tame grasses as well. It's just, it's bizarre, but people need to be aware of that. Whether through stunting or we've seen some pretty significant leaf burn as well. Uh, just with a simple 2,4-D on, on brome at the wrong time, for whatever reason, we can really ding, ding brome a lot. So uh, there was a study out of Nebraska and they did find, uh, you know, if you were to kind of rank the safety on brome, 240 is still the safest 
growth regulator herbicide they looked at, followed by Tordon, and, and Banville might be a little bit uh, harder on on Brome than uh, than 2,4-D. So that's just something to be aware of. You could see a little bit of injury. Uh, as we move into other herbicides that aren't growth regulators, the ones that were commonly used, we have a little bit of tall or a little bit of susceptibility in, in fescue to plateau and also to escort and some folks are actually now using that uh, susceptibility to escort or metsulfuron to their advantage now when they're trying to thin fescue out of uh, Bermuda grass stands or at least setting it back in in native grass stands as well. There's quite a bit of susceptibility to fescue uh, with escort. Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> and uh, the one, you know, we, we promote a lot of times in, in especially fescue, the benefits of lagoons and, and their advantages for animal gains. And, and if you have high endophyte fescue, it helps with uh, lowering that endophyte toxicity that we see uh, grazing fescue later in the summer. So lagoons have a lot of benefit. The problem is people want to control their lagoons or they want to control their weeds when they want to keep their lagoons. And there's just not a good way to get get that done outside of, uh, there is a chance that Lespedeza has some a little bit higher level of tolerance to some lower rates of 2,4-D than some of our other lagoons. So about the only one that lagoon that we can keep in a stand, and if we had some weeds to, to clean out there, thin out Lespedeza, annual Lespedeza would be the only one that at least has a little bit of an option with about a half a pound of two four D to the acre, but even at uh, even at that, uh, you know, you'd still ding up quite a bit of your lagoons, but with two four D, but you may not actually kill them, and so two four D might be the only option for folks if they're trying to save lagoons while trying to control weeds. So, not a lot of good options. There, but uh, again, we have a lot of options for just general broadleaf weed control. Um, and I we've been spending a lot more time talking about weed control in Bermuda grass because it does seem like it gets hindered quite a bit by early season shading. Uh, whether that is the shading effect, uh, and also could be complicated with using waters and, and nutrient as well. But uh, Bermuda grass seems awful susceptible to. Uh, to weed growth early in the spring, so we've been focusing some of our extension efforts on uh, getting good early season weed control in, in Bermuda grass. Of course, for broadleaves, it's easy, right? We can use all these other products we've been talking about, 2,4-D, Banville, Tordon, Remedy, um, Milestone, all of these have uh, great efficacy on broadleaves, and it's easy to kill broadleaves out of grass. Uh, again, this escort deal, and, and escort's becoming more popular just because it's uh, fairly cheap anymore. Uh, you can get a lot of generic metsulfuron out there for a uh, very affordable price, and so more people are actually using escort uh, for their broadleaf weed control as well. A little bit different mode of action, um, but uh, still a, a darn good herbicide for broadleaf weeds. Now, grass weeds are a little bit tougher to control. Go ahead, Walt. Um, that's, of course, you're trying to eliminate an annual grass out of a, a grass sod, so that's just a little bit more difficulty. And with, uh, back to the case of Bermuda grass, we, uh, we fight downy brome, cheat, really bad little barley. These are winter annual grasses. They compete very well with Bermuda grass because they come up when uh, Bermuda grass is dormant. And then they uh, gain a lot of momentum through the spring, and then they do a pretty good job of shading out the Bermuda grass in the spring. We have uh, several options for, uh, for some of this grass control uh, in Bermuda grass. We have Pastora is a new herbicide, or at least it's uh, newly labeled on Bermuda grass in the last several years. We've seen some, you can see some crop injury or some Bermuda grass injury with Pastora, but it does at least give us some grass options. Uh, Outrider is another one that uh, gets used fairly often. Both of these actually work good on Johnson grass, uh, but they both work pretty good on cheat as well. Okay, so cheat and downy brome, uh, they do have some efficacy against that, so it can help in the fight against those uh, cool season annual grasses. And then plateau is another one that again has some efficacy on on these uh, grasses. Now, the thing that we've been looking at, we've got some more uh, field demonstrations research sites out uh, this season as well as emerging growers to consider using glyphosate in the dormant season. It does have a label 
for dormant alfalfa, it will kill your Bermuda grass, of course, but uh, uh, after that is frozen off for the winter, um, and actually all these annual grasses are out there and annual broadleaves, uh, glyphosate, we're finding a really good uh, control option that's fairly cheap uh, for killing some of these annual grasses. And of course, uh, we would apply that not to actively growing Bermuda, that's gonna go out between November and March, depending on uh, how dormant the Bermuda grass is. So we've had trials looking at uh, Pastora and glyphosate in the past on Cheat and Downy Brome with uh, very good success of the glyphosate just as long as it put on uh, dormant season Bermuda grass. This is 100%, but even the, um, even the Pastora was given 90 plus percent control of the Downy Brome and Cheat, okay? And so uh, that's an option that I, I encourage growers to look at uh, ranchers to look at but as we get closer to that time where they're a little bit nervous about spraying glyphosate early in the spring. So just the next slide is a couple pictures of uh, how dramatic that effect can be. Of course, we put the glyphosate out there on the left. We did a good job getting it on before Bermuda grass had broke dormancy. You can see what kind of pressure we can deal with sometimes with all that cheat and downy brown. That's just a, a heck of a visual look at, um, and Pastor did a really good job as well. But I've really been uh, Bermuda grass up too. Even when it's coming out of dormancy, that Bermuda grass can be pretty susceptible to Pastora. Now, it almost always grows out of it, and uh, and you get good weed control out of it, but that sure makes some producers nervous. Now, when we look at warm season uh, grasses, uh, things like crabgrass, foxtail, and barnyard grass that um, we don't have quite as many options. Again, the pastor and the plateau might be something to consider. Uh, those really need to go on early though. Um, you have crabgrass, foxtail, barnyard grass, they all tend to come up in the month of April. And so um, um, you need to get pastor and plateau on pretty small because they just don't do a good job when these summer annual grasses uh, get some size to them. Now prowl is one that we're looking at too. It has a label on Bermuda grass, uh, but it's one that needs to be on, obviously, before the, the weed emerges. This is a pre-emergent herbicide, and there's quite a lengthy grazing and hang restriction on that, too, so producers need to be aware of that. But it can provide some, some grass control, foxtail, and barnyard grass control, if likely put on, in Kansas at least, around the 1st of April. Uh, that's generally early enough that uh, our grasses haven't emerged yet. And, of course, I, I always have producers come up to me and say afterwards their, their strategies and there is the strategy of early haying just to get that trash off there and let the Bermuda grass really thrive. Uh, or some folks just turn out and make the animals eat the weeds that are there or just some sort of early mowing and those all can uh, work as well. It doesn't have to always be about herbicides. Go ahead, Walt. Oh, nut sedge, yes. I had one other slide in here. We're, we're the wet part of Kansas, so we experience a lot of rainfall. Nut sedge is always a question that I get, and uh, we do at least have a nice option. And Outrider or Permit, um, they're labeled in Bermuda grass, and they just give excellent control of nut sedge. And, and a lot of these ALS, sulfonylurea herbicides, even Escort possibly could give some suppression of that too, but uh, Outrider and Permit are also pretty darn good on, on nut sedge. Okay, that brings us back to uh, some of the herbicides we use on, on uh, range and pasture. There's soil applied herbicides. Again, there's both dry materials as well as liquids. Uh, the Spike 20P, uh, it's tepithyron. Uh, give you a chart with some rates on that one. Uh, the Probenome Power Pellets and is a dry, another dry material. Uh, it has the same active ingredient, hexazinone, as Velpar L. And then Tordon 22K as a, as a liquid. Uh, Tordon 22K can be used for uh, eastern red cedar control. The rate is about three to four mils of Tordon for each three foot height of the tree. Uh, likewise, Valpar L, not only on eastern red cedar, but some other woody plants as well. And its application rate is two to four mils uh, per inch stem diameter on, on the plants. Uh, so here's a chart of, on some of the, the soil applied materials with spike and or the pronoun power pellets. And uh, as, as you see these charts in, in 
uh, not necessarily done research with all, all these trees and, and these products, but the trees are actually listed on the label as being controlled or not. Uh, so in this case, you see some, some of which the, the spike 20P uh, uh, may work, uh, like on cottonwood, whereas the power pellets evidently uh, do not. And then you see some, some of the other, other direction as, as well. But uh, there's some options, you know, these soil applied materials. You usually put them on a time of the year when you expect moisture to be received. Uh, so because they have to be uh, incorporated into the soil solution. Uh, here's a picture then of, of the pronome power pellets. They, they kind of look like an, an Alka-Seltzer tablet. And again, usually one, one to two of these pellets uh, based on the, the side per inch diameter on the trees. Uh, one of the, the downsides of, of, of hexazinone, whether it's put on as a, as a pellet or as a liquid, here's, here's a site that was actually treating uh, yucca plants and it did a good job of killing the yucca plants, but then you notice down the middle of this slide the uh, kind of a kill zone. Uh, hexazinone is fairly water soluble and, and will move even with slight slope as we had here and, and you'll get some grass damage. Although again, you know, usually the next growing season you have plants growing back into those areas. Uh, when we're doing cut stump applications, I wanted to use this, even though this is a kind of a small diameter plant uh, tree here, but you know, we really only need to spray the, the living tissue, the cambium, on the outer side of that cut surface. Uh, the central, you know, the dark wood there is non-living and, and it's not going to translocate any material. Uh, in this case, it, we also, you know, it was cut above the soil surface and a lot of our herbicides would say not only treat that cambium layer, but also then treat the sides all the way around to get better control. Uh, common honey locusts, you know, I've had people tell me this is public enemy number one in their minds and, and it's a, a kind of a difficult plant to deal with it, uh, in terms of difficult to control as well as having a thorns on it that make it kind of nasty. Um, some work we did, uh, this is a cut stump in, in December 2012. One of the advantages of cut stump, you know, that those carbohydrate cycles, that they don't make any difference. You can treat this with this method about any time of the year. Only thing we have to concern about, you know, you don't want to have water or snow up around the, the edge of these plants. Uh, but these treatments, you know, Remedy Ultra, which is triclopyrin it, the pasture guard is, is a mixture of triclopyr and fluoroxypyr. Uh, arsenal is uh, the mazapyr. Uh, Pathfinder 2 is, is uh, another triclopyr product. It's 75% uh, in active ingredient in that, and it's a ready-to-use product. And then milestone is, is amino pyrrolid. But you see in, in this particular year and, and with those treatments, rated seven months after treatment, these were all fairly effective on common honey locust. Other trees that, that we might use cut stump or basal bark, either one is just a picture of some scattered hedge. Uh, one of the problems that we get with hedge, you notice that on that right hand picture, we get a very waxy leaf. And uh, you know, if we're using a foliar spray, that may be difficult to penetrate, but cut stump and basal seem to be quite effective on, on hedge. Uh, other parts of the state and in other states, we may have oak species. Uh, this is kind of down in the, in the southeastern Kansas where we've got post and blackjack oak, but you see that you know, if, if you following fire or, or burning or fire or, or just cutting them off, you're going to get tremendous re-sprouting. Uh, those will be need to be treated if, if you're using a cut stump much earlier than this picture was taken. Uh, so here's again some, some cut stump treatments with their species. And you know, some of these uh, uh, are, you'll see some products are almost listed on all those trees. Uh, again, I, I'd emphasize that the, these tree species are listed on, on the labels. Uh, and some of them, you know, some of the products may or may not be terribly effective or vary in their effectiveness at, at least. Uh, the, uh, most of these products we've, we've talked about already, crossbow is, is used quite a bit on cut stumps. It's a mixture, you know, I think it has about a pound of triclopyr and two pounds of 2,4-D in it. Uh, one thing, I, I've got Roundup listed here, and uh, probably should have just said glyphosate. I think you really need to look at labels, and you'll find that, that some of the glyphosate products 
uh, are listed were for cut stump treatment on most always on non cropland areas, sometimes around farmsteads, but sometimes I'll have a list and it says farmsteads includes rangeland or that the non cropland includes rangeland and pasture. And in my mind, at least that, that means that those, those certain products that contain glyphosate can be uh, effectively used. Uh, so glyphosate and bandle, you know, those are products that maybe a farmer is more apt to have on hand rather than some of these other products that are specifically used uh, on range and pasture. Uh, so here's a little bit of a comparison, basal bark and, and cut stump, again, on honey locust. The other slide I showed you with where the cut stump was quite effective was 2012. This was 2011 and uh, not as good a control with the cut stump as in 2012. And you know, you look at the, the two comparisons with Remedy Ultra and Pasture Guard also seem to be a better control with, with basal treatment. But again, that, that depends on, I think, on the year and, and some of the environmental conditions those plants are under in that given year. Uh, Buckbrush, pretty common shrub, and, and again, I think I mentioned earlier as we look at the carbohydrate cycle on this plant, it leaves out, you know, certain latter part of April when we can still do prescribed burning, and it may take two or three years of consecutive burning to control it, but that can be effective on buckbrush. Uh, repeated mechanical treatment of buckbrush uh, can also be effective, particularly again in that early to mid-May time frame. A number of, of herbicides can be used. Uh, uh, but 2,4-D has been very effective, particularly if you get it on at the right time. Uh, you know, sometimes what we use depends on if there are other species in the area we might want to try to get. But you know, the Grazon and, and Chaparral plus D also have been effective on, on buckbrush. Smooth Schumach, uh, again, and this would be my recommended order, you know, well, not my recommended order uh, on this one. Uh, burning is not going to be effective on, on smooth shumac, unless you can burn in June, which would be pretty un unlikely. So most time when we use fire on smooth shumac, we increase, we may keep the plant small, but we increase the actual number of stems density in the area. Uh, repeated mechanical uh, removal of, of these tops, again, in that early to mid-June can be effective. It might take two or three years to do that. Uh, again, number of herbicides, but 2,4-D, even as low as a, as a Two pint per, per acre is, is really effective on smooth shumac. Uh, foliar treatments on, on common honey locusts, you know, generally uh, as a legume, we would expect products that, that are contain picloram, such as a grazon, a surmount, uh, those sort of products to be effective on honey locusts, and, and generally they are. We have two years of application here, 2011 and 12. Notice that the dates, though, and are uh, in July. Many times our woody plants were treating earlier in the summer, uh, but honey locust seems to be quite susceptible in that mid-July time frame. Uh, again, in addition to the, the picloram containing products, uh, you know, pasture guard, uh, maybe not as effective as some, but, but has some activity in certain years. Uh, Remedy Ultra, similarly. Uh, Milestone, which uh, is more of a broadleaf weed killer, uh, excellent on things like thistles and so forth, uh, but it is very effective on common honey locusts or black locusts uh, as a foliar treatment. Uh, it's also effective as a cut stump or, or basal bark. Uh, I put Streamline, it was in this study that I put out, and, and Streamline is not yet labeled for range and pasture. Uh, it may happen some point in time. Streamline contains a uh, uh, aminocyclopyrochlor plus uh, metsulfuron. It is labeled for, for non-crop areas, but it appeared to be very effective on common honey locusts. Eastern red cedar, again, a tree that, that we seem to be fighting throughout the central and, and southern Great Plains in many, many areas. Uh, you know, it's, it's again, very susceptible to fire. It's a non-sprouter, so we can desiccate two-thirds, three-fourths of those needles, usually that tree will go ahead and die. Uh, mechanically, cutting below any green branches will be effective. Uh, herbicides would be my last choice on, on red cedar, but there are some herbicides, that, again, the picloram, hexazinone, uh, surmount, uh, as well as met sulfur on it, you know, but they all require pretty high volumes where you almost need to soak the tree to be effective. 
And you know, you're usually talking about smaller trees if you're going to treat uh, with a herbicide on, on red cedar. Uh, some foliar treatments, again, on, on woody, woody plants. Uh, and some variability there. Some trees are much easier to control than others. Uh, and I didn't, I didn't include 2,4-D on this list, but again, 2,4-D is effective on buckbrush and smooth shoemat. One of the species that we're having to deal with more and more, particularly here, probably in Kansas, uh, you know, it's been in, in the state for a number of years, but these old world blue stems uh, haven't stayed put where they where they were planted and have been spreading out from, from uh, roadsides and, and in areas where they're planted, you know, they just don't seem to stay inside the fence with, with our higher rainfall areas for sure. And there's these two types, the Caucasian and then the what we call yellow blue stem on the right, which we can tell, you can see those seed heads are quite different, so we can differentiate between them. I've been doing a little work on this this plant and as well, during the last several years. Here's a kind of a, a dormant season pitcher in the white looking grass you see there in the foreground is Caucasian blue stem. And you can see in the background where it's actually spread out from an area where it probably had been planted at one time. A uh, study done down in Chase County where I'm using, you know, glyphosate will control old world blue stem. Of course, it controls everything else pretty much. So we're looking at something that's more selective and we're finding that uh, Amazapir, uh, trade name Arsenal, at pretty low rates, a uh, quarter pound. This particular picture in the foreground was treated just one time in mid-June, and this is three months later. Uh, the green you see in the picture are native warm season grasses that survived the treatment. Uh, that stuff that's looking brown or gray then are the old world blue stems. The back part of the picture was actually sprayed twice about eight weeks apart with the quarter pound of, of a mass up here. Uh, again, uh, Doug had mentioned some of the grazing restrictions with some of our products. Again, it's, it's an important thing to remember. Many of them, though, that we use in range and pasture, at least these ones I have listed here, you see there's, there's no waiting period before, before grazing, at least with beef cattle. Uh, if you're using dairy animals, then there, that would be a different story. Uh, but there are some differences before hay harvest, you know, sometimes if particularly, well, whether it's on native grass or, or some of our improved pastures, if we're going to hay those, uh, if, you're, if you're using some of these products, you can see fairly significant waiting period. And that's particularly true, maybe some of our older herbicides uh, or those that contain 2,4-D, for instance, you'll see there's, there's at least a 30-day waiting period. And then there's some waiting before slaughter, again, with some of the products. So we're about ready to, to wrap things up and, and uh, put, try to put together a list of benefits of, of brush and weed control. And you know, hopefully if we're, we're, we're treating a problem that will get some increased forage production and or availability that will help uh, pay for that, that treatment. Uh, sometimes we can get easier livestock handling. Uh, we can man manipulate habitat, wildlife habitat. Uh, that's probably more done in areas where particularly where maybe where lease hunting is, is, is being done and as we get into Oklahoma and Texas. Uh, but you don't, you know, rather than treating entire areas, you can do that in, in patterns or strips uh, to maintain certain plants for, for both food and, and cover uh, for wildlife species. Uh, maybe hopefully we can get some increased water yield. We know some of these plants, like I think eastern red cedar, salt cedar, you know, we're talking about plants that they can use oh, 70, 80, gallons of water per day. Uh, and sometimes we, we, we can do the brush control maybe to, to clear an area for, for other treatments such as, as seeding. So in summary, you know, I think we need to treat these problem species when they first show up because the longer we wait, it usually is going to increase the cost uh, for dealing with, with the issue. Uh, broadcast herbicides uh, for control of Broadly, we control. I rarely recommend that unless it's affecting grazing distribution. Uh, if they're real dense, you know, you may get some payback for that, or for dealing with noxious weeds. That's also a, that's a different story. So again, I think you know proper grazing management, using our stocking rates like we should, appropriate use of prescribed burning and, and spot treatment with herbicides uh, will help prevent you know, extensive tree and, and brush problems. With that, I think we're we're through and. Time for questions. I guess we could do the. All right. Yeah.